We have a few more folks. We invite you to come on in, find a place. Welcome to this special evening featuring a, a conversation where people take opposing points of view. Uh, Non-Christians call that an argument. <laughs> We're going to call it, call it a debate on the interpretation of Romans chapter 7, particularly verses 14 to 25. The two conversation partners this evening will be Dr. Craig Blomberg, Professor Emeritus of New Testament at Denver Seminary, and Dr. Joey Dodson, holder of the Craig L. Blomberg Chair of New Testament at Denver Seminary. I'm sure there's some power differential there that we're going to have to figure out <laughs> as we move on uh, in the conversation. And let me just say that Denver Seminary is pleased to offer this event it is an expression of our commitment to biblical scholarship, grounded in our belief in the inspiration, inerrancy, and authority of Scripture. Uh, this theological conviction and the institutional commitment to it have been a part of Denver Seminary since the seminary's founding in 1950, and it remains at the core of our identity and mission. And Denver Seminary's mission is simply this, to prepare men and women to engage the needs of the world with the redemptive power of the gospel and the life-changing truth of Scripture. Another core commitment at Denver Seminary is what we call charitable orthodoxy. We hold fast to Christian orthodoxy. At the same time, we recognize that on many hermeneutical and theological issues, those who agree on the primary tenets of the faith may disagree with one another on the implications of those tenets on our understanding of the Bible, theology, mission, and Christian practice. In those disagreements, we are committed to engage one another charitably, orthodox and charitable, to listen to one another and to learn from one another in our different points of view. This evening's conversation is designed to model that value at Denver Seminary. Dr. Vernon Grounds, former dean, president, and chancellor, and in a Protestant sort of way, the patron saint of Denver Seminary, said it this way in the mid-1960s about Denver Seminary. Here is no unanchored liberalism, freedom to think without commitment. Here is no encrusted dogmatism, commitment without freedom to think. Here is a vibrant evangelicalism, commitment with freedom to think within the limits laid down in Scripture. Our event this evening is designed to celebrate the powerful legacy of biblical scholarship at Denver Seminary and its centrality for the future of Denver Seminary. To that end, we have established the Craig L. Blomberg Chair of New Testament. This chair provides its holder, Dr. Dodson, with increased time and funding for scholarship and writing. It has been funded by a generous donor for a 20-year period. Our desire is to see God provide additional funding that will make the chair permanently endowed. To that end, we've been asking alumni and other friends of the seminary to consider making a gift to the endowed chair with the goal of making it permanent. And I'd like to ask you to consider that as well. On your chairs, you found an envelope in which you could make a gift. And then in your program, you can see a QR code, which would also allow you to make a gift to this chair. Uh, we have received about a half of what we need in, in terms of additional funding to the original endowment. And we're trusting God to provide the rest. So this evening, we're going to consider together the interpretation of Romans chapter 7, particularly verses 14 to 25. And I'd like to just briefly introduce to you the two participants. Uh, Dr. Craig Blomberg joined the faculty of Denver Seminary in 1986, and he is currently Professor Emeritus of New Testament. He completed his PhD in New Testament at Aberdeen University in Scotland, specializing in the parables and the writings of Luke Acts. He received an MA from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and a BA from Augustana College 
Before joining the faculty at Denver Sem of Denver Seminary, he taught at Palm Beach Atlantic, and he was also a research fellow in Cambridge, England at Tyndale House. Uh, you know, you've read the things that Craig has contributed to the body of literature in New Testament studies. Personally, very grateful, Craig, for all that you've done. In addition to writing numerous articles in professional journals, multi-author works and dictionaries or encyclopedias, he has authored and edited 20 books, maybe more now. Is that a good number? Close? Maybe more. Maybe more. <laughs> including the historical reliability of the Gospels, interpreting the parables, commentaries on Matthew, 1 Corinthians, and James. He has a book entitled Jesus and the Gospels, an Introduction and Survey, another from Pentecost to Patmos, Christians in an Age of Wealth, a Biblical Theology of Stewardship, Neither Poverty or Riches, all those titles that we are all familiar with and that have added to our appreciation for our understanding of the New Testament, and most of all, Craig, to our adoration of Jesus. Thank you for that. Craig just told me that he's recently been elected to the executive committee of ETS and will continue to provide leadership there at the Evangelical Theological Society. Dr. Dodson, Dr. Joseph Dodson, better known as Joey to all of us, is the Craig L. Blomberg Endowed Chair of New Testament holder. He studied also at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and at the University of Tübingen in Germany. In addition to many academic and devotional essays, he has written a number of articles for top-tier peer-reviewed journals, such as the Harvard Theological Review, Novum Testamentum, the Journal for Jewish Studies, and Catholic Biblical Quarterly. His most recent books include Paul and the Giants of Philosophy, Reading the Apostle in Greco-Roman Context. That was an IVP book published in 2019 and co-edited with David Briones. The Things I Want to Do, Romans 7, Revisited. That's coming out when? The summer? Good. Who's publishing that? Lexham. He also has a book which you found, I think, on your chairs. A Little Book for New Bible Scholars with E. Randolph Richards. It's not little Bible scholars, right? It's a little book for <laughs> Bible scholars because I don't think I qualify for the other one. Uh, one of the things we appreciate most about Joey is his willingness and ability to see the New Testament and bring the New Testament into contemporary contexts in ways that are powerful and meaningful. So what's the format for our conversation this evening? Each participant will begin by presenting their uh, basic interpretation of the passage. Then each will respond to the other's presentation. Then each will make concluding, concluding remarks. They will do that in order. Then they and I will come to the stage. We'll have you submit questions uh, related to this evening. They'll come via the magic of the internet, onto a little screen, and then we will uh, share those and try to answer those. I want to just uh, make a couple of comments about the passage, and then I will read it so we're familiar with the language of the passage. Susan Eastman states that there are a few passages in the apostles' letters that have caused, quote, more consternation and received more attention than this one. Michael Byrd introduces this passage in his commentary by likening it to the incoming turbulence a pilot warns passengers, passengers about. So as to say, fasten, quote, fasten your exegetical seatbelts because this is where it gets bumpy. <laughs> James Dunn concludes that our position on Romans 7, quote, will in large measure determine our understanding of Paul's theology as a whole. Wow. So let me read the passage, and then I'm going to invite Craig to come and make the first presentation, and then they will just move through their conversation, as I mentioned before. I'm going to start reading in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, that's eight, excuse me, it's important to be in the right chapter when you start reading scripture, <laughs> 714. We know that the law is spiritual, 
But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Confusing enough? So I find, Paul goes on, this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the, to the law of sin. And then Joey asked that I read through verse 4 of chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So let me pray for us in our evening, and then Craig, I'd like to invite you to come and begin. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, it is our desire to understand what you have given us in this passage of Scripture through the Apostle Paul. We receive it as a gift, and we ask that you would illumine our minds and our hearts, that you would bend our thinking to what you have revealed to us, and you would bend our wills to what you desire for us. I pray for Craig and for Joey as they talk about this passage, that your spirit would empower them and enlighten them to help us better understand what you want us to understand here. Thank you for their commitment to you, to your people, and to your mission. And we pray it in your Son's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Craig, please. Let's welcome Craig, shall we? Thanks, sir. Thank you very kindly. I was asked to say a few words before we start in on Romans on uh, my profound gratitude for the donor who I have no idea who it is and who made this amazing gift and uh, am thrilled that uh, Seminary would like to extend it beyond the uh, 20 years that he gave money for. Um, I was asked to say a little something about why Dr. Dodson, who from now on I will just call as he likes to be called Joey. Um, I have to interrupt myself already and say I'm reminded of when I was 
studying in Scotland and Jimmy Carter was president. And the Brits just could not understand how somebody that far up in authority would want to be called Jimmy. <clears throat> now that I've made my peace with that, Joey is easy. Um, I don't think we gave you credit for all the places you studied. He um, went to Southwestern Seminary for a Master of Divinity. Before that, to Washita Baptist University in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, which has sent us, even before he joined the faculty, but now especially since he joined, a steady stream of wonderful graduates and students, so we're grateful for that. If you've never heard of Washita, it looks on a piece of paper like it should be pronounced Uachita, but it's Washita. Um, Joey has the ability to um, write for the Harvard Theological Review. I never even tried to submit an article to that <clears throat> ethereal um, publication. And uh, he can write at the popular level, and he can keep uh, junior high youth group kids, squirrely kids, enthralled, um, just to an amazing ability to range over just about every audience possible. I have not seen him at work with two-year-olds, but he is a grandfather at much too tender an age, so pretty soon we're going to get a chance to see, see how that works also. But just thrilled that we have somebody of his quality here and hope you will uh, consider giving... Um, for him and for the seminary. Now, somewhere there was supposed to be somebody. Ah, okay, I am being timed. But I won't tell you how long it is. <laughs> we didn't have the time to read all of Romans. But I think we need to get the flow of thought. Paul begins after introduction and thanksgiving by establishing in chapters 1 to 5 the universal sinfulness of humanity, justification by faith, um, the reconciliation that we have with God as a result. And in 6.1 asks the rhetorical question, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Presumably, he wouldn't ask the question if somebody else wasn't asking it, or at least that he didn't think it was possible that somebody might have that attitude. He then uses that famous Greek expression, meganoito, which just doesn't have a good English translation. Um, heck no is pretty close, but you probably need a slightly stronger Four-letter word that also starts with H-E there at the beginning. And for the next several verses, one could be forgiven for thinking that Paul doesn't think a believer would ever sin. Because by the time we get to verse 6, he says, We know that our old self was crucified with him. Is there a more decisive death? so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So we're taken a bit by surprise when in verse 11, Paul turns from indicative statements to imperatives and says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Preview what this discussion, dialogue, debate, whatever D word suits you best, um, boils down to is, can a Christian be said to be enslaved 
to sin or to have sin as its master, his or her master, uh, or to have sin reign over them. We both agree that Christians sin. We both agree that Christians sin a lot. <laughs> the question is, is this language of mastery appropriate for believers? And it seems to me right here before we ever get to chapter 7 that it has to somehow be a danger for believers or Paul wouldn't bother to command believers not to let sin reign in your mortal body. 6.13 to the end of the chapter basically does the same thing that the first half of the chapter does. It makes statements that make it sound like sin is utterly eradicated, and then it turns around and tells us not to be slaves to sin. When we come to 7.7, 7, all of a sudden, Paul appears to be talking autobiographically. In verses 7 to 13, he uses entirely past tense verbs about, apparently, his past and how he was alive once apart from the law, but when the law came, sin revived and he died. And one can imagine him from his Jewish background thinking perhaps of as a young boy without understanding God's demands, reaching a stage maybe even at around the age 12 or 13 when there may have been a precursor to the later bar mitzvah ceremony and taking on the yoke of the commandments, when suddenly he realized how much he was accountable to God, and in that sense realized how much sin was still working in his life. But he may also be talking representatively, not just for himself, but for any Jewish person or for any fallen human being since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Strikingly, in 7.14, all of a sudden, he changes to completely present tense verbs. Now, I think that was the angels affirming. <laughs> now, maybe not. They stopped. Um, <clears throat> he, he starts speaking entirely in the present tense. Now, those of you that have heard of the concept of verbal aspect theory will know that tense can do a lot of different things besides just speaking about time, especially outside of the indicative mood. But even proponents of verbal aspect theory acknowledge that in the indicative mood, somebody's just simply making straightforward statements in the past tense or in the present, the most common by far the most common meaning is past time and present time. I am unspiritual, verse 14, sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I do. And you heard President Young read that very slowly and carefully. I tend to get worked up and read it faster and what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do, what I do not want to do. And pretty soon there's just a lot of doo-doo. <laughs> Thank you. Can this possibly be Paul speaking as a Christian? He does say along the way that I delight in God's law in my inner being. And he speaks about the law of his mind that is at war with the law of sin and death that's working in him. But he finally gets frustrated enough that in verse 24 he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And, and then comes the Joyous exclamation, 
Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And even though it's in the, the present tense, one could imagine him saying, I know this deliverance is coming. Hallelujah. And that would swing the pendulum to this being Paul before he's a Christian. Except then utterly abruptly and unexpectedly, he ends by saying, so then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. That has been so jarring that over the centuries, some commentators have proposed to amend the text and reverse the two parts of verse 25, thinking that surely Paul must have written it that way, because it makes no sense this way. But there's utterly no manuscript support anywhere for that having happened. But then we come to 8.1, and Joey is right. The, the chapter division probably introduces more of a break in our mind than, than there should be. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now we know he's talking about Christians. He says it, those who are in Christ Jesus. And we think, right. He was talking about himself in the past. But we keep on reading. And the tension hasn't gone away. If we go beyond 8.4, where President Young stopped reading, we have the contrast in verse 5 between those who live according to the flesh and those who live in accordance with the Spirit. And by the time we get to verse 10, there's a sort of penultimate summary and again, it's clear here that this has to be the Christian because Paul says, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Is it possible to say that we have been, as believers, as the overarching principle freed from sin, and at the same time, on occasion, when we make the bad choices and only we ourselves are accountable, that we can wind up serving sin, another way to translate being a slave to sin. It seems like 810 countenances that possibility. And there is a very similar passage in Galatians 5. It's not exactly the same, but it's close enough that I think it's relevant. When Paul says in 5.16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Sound like what we were just talking about in Romans 7? And these are direct commands to people who have the Spirit and therefore can walk by them. At times throughout church history, the view that Joey's going to defend has been the dominant one. In certain theological traditions, even today, the view Joey's going to defend has been the dominant one. But Dr. Sung Wook Chung is here. I would, I would like to quote him. He's one of our systematic theologians. He doesn't know I'm going to do this. We were talking about it, and he said, Aquinas, Augustine, Luther, Calvin, how can you go against those four? They all took the side that this was Paul speaking as a believer. Does this give us the right to be complacent about sin? Here's the pastoral rub, and... Joey has met more people than I have, apparently, but I don't doubt that there are plenty of them out there who use Romans 7 as an excuse for choosing to knowingly, flagrantly, maybe even happily violate 
fundamental principles of God's word and then just excuse themselves by saying, well, even Paul said, I don't do what I want to do. No, I don't countenance that for one moment. But allow me to, as my time is running out, quote C.E.B. Cranfield, who for many years was university, of, university professor of New Testament at Durham University in England, wrote a major two-volume commentary on Romans that was published in 1975 and 1979. And he explains how, on the one hand, you can speak of Christians growing in sanctification, growing in the faith, never a straight line, lots of ups and downs, but overall still making progress, still distancing themselves from their past, and yet become even more aware of their sinfulness. This is how he puts it. The farther people advance in the Christian life and the more mature their discipleship, the clearer becomes their perception of the heights to which God calls them. And the more painfully sharp their consciousness of distance between what they ought and want to be and what they are. The assertion that this cry could only come from an unconverted heart and that the apostle must be expressing not what he feels as he writes, but the vividly remembered experience of the unconverted person is, we believe, Cranfield's words, totally untrue. How then do we fit it all together? Here is my summary that I think is true to his larger discussion, but these are my words. Once we had no choice but to be slaves to sin. One day we will have no choice but to be slaves to righteousness. Now we have a choice. Choose well. Thank you, Craig. Those of you who know Dr. Blomberg know that his love language is puns. <laughs> and greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down a pun for his brother. I'm not as adroit at puns as Dr. Blomberg, but here goes. Craig, the other night, someone broke into my house and stole all my fruit. I can't believe it. I'm peachless. I, I'm almost speechless uh, when I think about the honor it is to hold the chair that bears your name. Sincerely thank God for what you've done for, the scholar, for scholarship and for the church. And by his grace, I'm going to make every effort to follow in your footsteps except for your reading of Romans 7. <laughs> Did, do you like that transition? Uh, did I rush it? I felt like I rushed it. Yeah. And I'm going to tie myself to a manuscript tonight because I get excited and start talking too loud. And what should be 14 minutes will end up going to 40 minutes instead. Uh, but when I think about this perennial debate on Romans 7, I'm reminded of a quote by Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, Before I understood the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, whenever sin would knock on the door, I would answer it. But now that I understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, whenever sin knocks, I let Christ get the door. He goes on to say that, uh, And when Christ answers the door, at the side of the nail prints in his hand and his pierced side, then sin will get the inferno out of there. So also, when it comes to our relationship with sin, Paul says over and again, sin is no longer the boss of you and me. We no longer have to answer the door. We can let Christ get the door. Consequently, evil, desire, anger, and lust should no longer govern, rule, or dominate us. 
In Galatians, for instance, for instance, Paul commands us to live by the power of the Spirit, and we will not ever, ever, ever fulfill the desires of our sinful nature. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, he does go on to say the flesh goes against the Spirit, and the Spirit goes against the flesh. But because of that, we no longer do the shameful things that we want to do. Or to put it another way, the newfound liberty that we have no longer gives us license to satisfy our lust. Paul goes on to say that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, something we don't see very much in Romans 7, and that those who belong to the Lord have crucified their flesh along with its passions and desires. Like the apostle, we've been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to us so that we no longer live, not us, but Christ that lives within us. And because of that, we walk empowered by faith, not shackled to sin. It's not just Galatians and 1 Thessalonians. Paul comes and says, this is God's will for your life. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, that you are holy, that you don't treat your bodies like those who treat their bodies like a wonderland rather than a temple. He even ends his letter by saying this, I pray that the Lord will sanctify you wholly and completely through and through, so that your body, soul, and spirit may be blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes. And if you think that is a pipe dream, uh, getting Russell uh, Wilson to be your quarterback, a, a rhetorical sentiment, Paul says, oh, by the way, the God who calls you, he is faithful to do it. It's not just in Galatians and 1 Thessalonians. Later on at the end of Paul's ministry, he writes to Titus. And to Titus, he says, hey, the grace of God has shown up. The grace of God has come to teach you how to say, heck to the no, no, to the no, 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 to sin. And ah, yeah, to righteousness and self-control. That, that's how I read the Greek. Is that your translation of the Greek as well? Of course, Paul does warn the Corinthians that we can be fleshly uh, and we can fall. He tells us that we will continue to face temptation, but God is faithful, and every time we do, he will provide a way out. This theme of righteous living also recurs in Romans. Their believers are to be the Lord's obedient servants, no longer slaves to sin, but children of righteousness, reaping the benefit of holiness, resulting in lasting life. The good news rings forth. The church no longer has any obligation to obey the tyranny of sin. Instead, the Spirit, by the Spirit now, they can put to death the misdeeds of their bodies so that they will live. Therefore, by God's grace and in his love, we are to lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, clothing ourselves with Christ and giving no quarter, no provision to the flesh and its paltry desires. No retreat, no surrender. Nevertheless, despite these verses and their promises, Romans 7 is the one passage that stands as the outlier the oddball that dampens the mood and rains on our parade. To be sure, at first glance, it seems to fly in the face of everything that Paul has written and will go on to write. And although this passage is the anomaly, the weirdo, it, it's the place where most Christians base their understanding of our relationship with sin. But most scholars reject these, the interpretation that these verses depict Paul's life as a Christian. A growing course, therefore, also dismisses the notion that Paul intends the wretched monologue, what we see in 7, 14 through 25, meant to describe a believer's relationship with sin. Further, this was not, as uh, Craig had brought up, the view of the first interpreters of Romans. Nevertheless, against the grain of these earliest church theologians and modern scholarship, most pastors and lay people subscribe to this ex explanation that here in Romans 7, Paul portrays the normal, typical Christian experience. And this reading usually leads believers to think that moral failure is inevitable. If a person wakes up each day convinced that they're going to sin, hasn't sin already won? In other words, in light of this popular interpretation of Romans 7, it reinforces a despair at being defeated by unwanted desires. So with this view, we can do all things through Jesus Christ, except live a godly life, it seems. And, and out of this perspective, God can do immeasurably more than you can ask for or imagine, except help you overcome temptation. As a result, we wrongly deduce that we are, the, we are wretched to the core and defined more by our bondage to sin than by our bond with Christ. 
As Greg mentioned, I've regularly heard this reading used to excuse sin. An extreme example would, in my last uh, church, I confronted a man who was abandoning his wife and children for another woman. and said, how can you do this? And he said, like Paul, the things I want to do, I do not do. To me, that doesn't sound like Paul. That sounds like the Emily Dickinson line, the heart wants what the heart wants, or else it doesn't care. But, but I don't think that Paul is talking about the regular Christian life here. I'm persuaded that it doesn't mean the normal Christian life, his own or otherwise. I don't think that Paul says in the same breath in Romans 6 and Romans 8, you're free from sin, you're free from sin, you're free from sin, you're free from sin. And then in Romans 7, it's like, ah, just kidding. Kind of, not really. Maybe, nevertheless, um, per se, um, I believe that unlike the wretch in Romans 7, we no longer have to answer sin salutations. Every time it knocks, we don't have to answer it. Too often, believers have gone to Romans 7, and that's why many of us kind of endorse this popular view of Romans 7. We go seeking comfort after we've been conquered by sin, rather than going to it to see the promise that we don't have to continue to be. There are two chief, two chief alternatives to the popular interpretation that Dr. Blomberg brought out. First, scholars mostly subscribe to the view that Paul is putting on a mask here, impersonating someone who is living under the law rather than walking in the spirit. This interpretation gains even more gravity when we consider that this was the way the earliest readers of Roman took, Romans took it, not to mention my great um, hero who strangely warmed, John Wesley. The other alternative is that Romans 7 is talking about Paul's pre-Christian life before Christ knocked him off his donkey uh, on the road to Damascus. That was then, this is now. Now, therefore, there's no condemnation for the law of the spirit has set me free from the life of, from the law of sin and death. So my aim here is not really to argue for one of those alternatives over against the other, um, as much as it is to argue against Blomberg's uh, view. Uh, that the Christian is a slave, that Paul was a slave to sin, unable to do any good. It contradicts the earliest readings of Romans, uh, the other passages where Paul talks about himself, as well as where he talks about other believers with relationship to sin. And three, what Paul has just said in Romans 6 and what he'll go on to say in Romans 8. We're going to look at Romans, uh, we're going to look at the third one of those and focus on the context of Romans 7. Most of you likely know the first rule of Mime Club. You do not talk about mime club. (laughs) And maybe you also know the first rule of biblical interpretation. You do not neglect the context. Context determines meaning. And so let's look at that context, starting with Romans 6. As uh, Craig mentioned, he asked that question, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? And Paul says, heck to the no, no, to the no. I'd love for Elodie to give her translation of Meganoita there. But, but this is Paul's reasoning here. Paul comes and says, Jesus Christ died to sin once and for all. Amen? With me? Christ died to sin once and for all. We died with Christ through baptism. Therefore, we are dead to sin so that now we should live a new life. This new life no longer continues in sin, cowers before the flesh, or complies to its desires. For through baptism, believers were crucified with the Lord so that their bodies are no longer captive to iniquity. In other words, having died with Christ, we should live with Christ. And just as the Lord died to sin and lives to God, so also believers should count themselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul goes on to accentuate the truth that God is the church's master and sin is not. In fact, not wanting his readers, us, to miss this promise, he repeats repeats himself to the point of being redundant and superfluous and saying it again and again and repetitive. You get it. Once again, Paul underscores how those who are redeemed by grace do not live under the law and should not, under any circumstances, let sin reign in them again. Those in Christ must cease and desist from obeying sin's desires and from offering their body parts to it as instruments of wickedness and as weapons against righteousness. Paul then fires off another rhetorical question. Shall we continue in sin because we're no longer the law, but under grace? Again, his answer is a resounding nope. Nah, no, nope. A person is a slave to whichever master they serve. In this case, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, people can only have one master. Their choice of lords, according to Paul, is sin, which leads to death, or obedience resulting in righteousness. To to remove all doubt, Paul says that we pledge our allegiance to the Lord. 
Sin is the former master with whom we should never, ever, ever get back together. For, for those keeping score, I have uh, a slide to see how many times Paul says, you're not a slave to sin, you're not a slave to sin, you're not a slave to sin, you're not a slave to sin. It's something important to realize as we continue to go into chapter 7. It's a recurring theme that helps us identify the wretch in Romans 7. So we get to Romans 6 and 7, we see that they contain uh, parallels that highlight how the gospel has liberated believers from sin and also unfettered them from the law. For instance, Paul starts Romans 6 with a don't you know statement to stress how believers who were once baptized in the death of Christ have been free from sin so as to walk in the newness of life. The apostle begins Romans 7 with the same don't you know. Um, This time he does so to explain how those familiar with the law have through Christ died to the law. So they were released from the old way of the letter and now walk in the newness of the spirit. We get to verses five and six. Scholars, most scholars say that what Paul does in verses five through six, if you're following along in your Bible, is give us really the outline of what we see in the rest of chapter seven and the rest of chapter eight, where chapter five gives us a preview of what he's going to talk about in the rest of chapter seven, uh, where it's going to talk about this wretch whose life is marked by sin, 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 flesh, 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 death, death, death. But then in verse 6, Paul looks forward to what he's going to unpack in chapter 8, elucidating the new life marked with the Spirit, freedom, righteousness, and peace. In this case, verses 5 and 6 provide proof that the audience has an awareness to the solution to the wretch's dilemma, which the apostle is about to detail. The antithesis in verses 5 and 6, where the old life versus the new life, as well as Paul's language of being enslaved uh, under sin, how he is unspiritual, how he's sold as a slave to sin, and that he can't do any good, leads most scholars to reject the popular view outright. Additionally, the absence of the Holy Spirit in the wretched struggle serves as another critical point against the popular view. If you read through Romans 7, there's no spirit, there's no spirit, there's no spirit. It seems like the guy is all by himself. But when we get to Romans 8, we see that the spirit's here, he's there, he's every everywhere. And because of that, there's no more mention or hint of despair or this constant defeat of Um, by sin. And so it begins with no condemnation. It ends with no separation. And everywhere in between, you have this idea of victory. Um, There's no defeat. So we get to chapter eight, and I thank Dr. Young for bringing this out because part of our problems is that we take Romans seven out of context and use it for a pretext as a proof text. But Paul goes on, and we know that chapters and verses were not in the original biblical text and can sometimes influence our interpretation of the passage. So just as it's influential to place Romans 7 side by side to see the continuity of Paul's argument, it's also good to see and remember that 7 extends into Romans 8. So in 7 stands as a negative counterpart to chapter 8. And whereas in Romans 7, all the I does is sin, 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 no matter what. In Romans 8, we got the power um, to finally resist sin. Over against the frustration and the self-denigration of the eye, Paul proclaims in 8.1 that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the loss and the death. I get excited. Uh, through the incarnate Christ, God did what the good yet weak law could not do in Romans 7, which is really what Romans 7 is about. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us. I don't think this is just a status. I think this is um, an empowerment for us to live righteously. Unlike the miserable creature in Romans 7, now we walk according to the Spirit, according to the Holy Ghost, and there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Since the life of the Spirit in Christ Jesus is stronger than the indwelling sin in us, it sets his people free. The sin which has overthrown the wretch in Romans 7 has now been overthrown in Romans 8. Mm. Considering what Paul writes in this passage about his life and the victory believers have over sin, both in Romans 6, Romans 8, and everywhere else in Paul's letters, um, it it reminds me of, as a child, I used to watch Sesame Street. And I don't know if you guys remember uh, Cookie Monster, where he would bring out this plate of cookies and he would sing, one of these things are not like the other, one of these just don't belong. So also, when we put Romans 7 aside, Everywhere else, Paul talks about our relationship with sin and temptation. It's the odd cookie that probably shouldn't be on the same plate. In conclusion, to be sure, I admit that believers' hearts are still prone to wander and inclined to fall. It's me. But there's a monumental difference between the enslaved wretch in Romans 7 and the liberated believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Namely, the latter, we have the Spirit who enables us to grow in godliness and who energizes us to deny sin more and more. This stark contrast of sin ruling over us is different than sin remaining in us. It's a difference between sin dictating us from an iron throne versus it attacking us from a miry trench. So sure, we must struggle to allow sin not to regain mastery, but we do so on our assumption of our liberation from sin, not our unavoidable slavery to it. Thank you. And now we each get much, much less time for a rebuttal. And I'm losing my electronics. I'll just go through the order in which I took notes on what Joey said. Um, Quoted some great statements from Luther, but... Luther's also the one who, in writing his commentary on Romans at chapter 7, verses 14 to 25, penned the famous Latin expression, simul justus et peccator, simultaneously just or justified, and a sinner. And as I mentioned, Luther didn't side with Joey overall. Um, There's a lot in which I think Joey's agreeing with me, and he just doesn't realize it. <laughs> let, let, let me read some exact quotes. We can let Christ answer the door. Absolutely. That's not saying it's guaranteed. Sin should no longer reign over us. Absolutely. But why say it if it's not a possibility? This is God's will for your life, sanctification or holiness. Have you ever not done something that was God's will? I think we all have. I pray that the Lord will sanctify. Well, if it's guaranteed, there's no need to pray for it. I don't pray that the sun will come up in the morning. Kind of assume it will. The church no longer has any obligation to obey sin. Exactly. I I ended my talk by saying once we had no choice... Now we have a choice. Choose well. Is Romans 7 the outlier? No. That's why I started in chapter 6. So I kept on going to chapter 8. I apologize. I didn't know we were doing um, audiovisual aids. I could have put a slide together. Um, Showed you how many times in these chapters Paul commands believers not to let sin reign over them. Of course, if I'd put it in the same font, none of you would have been able to read it anyway. But uh, (laughs) am I saying, and I know there are some people who have said this, am, am I saying that Paul thinks the normal, typical, regular, those were the three adjectives I heard, Christian experience is this. I can't say that Southern expression uh, at any speed. Um, (laughs) Heck no. No, I don't think that's what Paul is saying. He's not saying that he wakes up every morning and, and... feels defeated by sin. He's just saying there are significant times in his life or significant contexts in which, I tell you, these angels keep interrupting me, that that sin um, seems to have 
a pretty strong foothold, and it, and it creates this level of frustration. I love what uh, a scholar by name of, is it Will Timmons, says that this is not a Christian experience, but it is a Christian's experience. It's not normal. It's not normative. It's not what we can use as an excuse. But it is something that we experience. Um, I never actually heard a response to the question of if it is impossible for a Christian to be enslaved to sin ever, then why so often are we commanded not to have that be a possibility, not to allow that to happen in our lives? have to be selective here because I'm going to follow the clock. <laughs> we have to extend further into chapter 8. I agree, but we have to extend further than Joey did. I read verse 10, but look at verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Well, that's pointless on Joey's view. Why even say it? Because it's not a possibility. Verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. It's a, it's a criterion. Are you going to allow the Spirit to lead you today? Or are you going to choose to grieve the Spirit, quench the Spirit? Four zeros on the clock. We don't want sin to gain mastery over us. But is it guaranteed that that can't happen? Jesus said, you can't serve two masters, but in the end of 725, somebody was serving two masters. Whether it's the pre-Christian or post-Christian, Paul, as, as Paul says, simultaneously he's a slave to God's law and a slave to the law of sin. So he must be using slavery in a slightly different way than Jesus was. So much, thank you. My, my argument is that Romans 7, I is not the typical Christian experience. And so to answer your question, can a Christian be enslaved? Yes, but they shouldn't be. And I don't think Paul was. And I think Paul gives this great warning that if you, I mean, Romans 6.23, for uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Uh, and um, this, the wages of sin, sorry, youth pastor coming out. Um, the, <laughs> This is, not a, this is not an evangelistic verse. This is a warning for the believers. So if you do live enslaved to sin, if you do live, go back to the Romans 7 life, then that's the case. And so when many people read Romans 7, they think that Romans 7 is the rule, and occasionally we get it right. Um, but for Paul, by the power of the Holy Spirit, now when we sin, it's that exception. To bring John in, uh, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But, but if you do, then don't worry. We have a God who is faithful and just. And so the expectation, well, many people read Romans 7 that this is Paul. I don't think Paul was a slave to sin. Uh, again, there's no mention of Jesus Christ answering the door. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit uh, in Romans 7 either. So, uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned Luther. Yes, Luther is the one who we, most of us read Romans 7 through the eyes of Luther, whether we know it or not. Uh, but we don't read it through all of Luther. We read it through a section of Luther because Luther comes and says, but what? What Paul really meant, um, and for, for you plebes, you can't really get it, but what he really meant is not that he couldn't do any good, but that he just couldn't do as much good as he would want, as often as he would like, as good as he would like for it to be to the extent. I agree with that. I just think that he has the right, the wrong doc, the right doctrine from the wrong passage. The guy in Romans 7, 
He, he can't do anything. And, and it's not even him that's doing it. It's sin that's dwelling within him. I don't know if the power, I don't know if Paul conceived of this idea of the power of sin still dwelling within us unless we invite sin back in. And so, yes, it is a possibility. But what Paul is saying is, that's who you used to be. Don't go back there. Uh, now we no longer live in flesh, 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 sin, 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 death, death, death. Now we live in freedom and liberty. And so our mind should no longer be that full of chaos, but instead, as we, the mind of the spirit, the one who walks according to spirit, it is peace. And so, yes, sin still comes at us, uh, but it comes at us not from that throne, but it comes from this trench warfare that it's coming with. Uh, you mentioned the interjection. Well, let's go back to, let's go to the Greek uh, tense. Uh, so, yeah, present tense doesn't mean present tense. Um, and the, the verb itself is not going to tell you anything. You have to look at the words that are surrounding that. And so there is a past and present, um, but the past and present is not there at verse 14. It's there eight one. Therefore, now. Um, so the, the shift in time is not found in the verbs, but it's found in the words surrounding the verbs, the conjunction, junction. Fantastic. And that therefore now is, is the shift of that. And so you, you brought in some of the Greek uh, manuscripts. I don't think that a 725 is a, somewhat a later in addition, but there is a textual variant where Paul says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set. So some say you, and I think that's probably the better reading, but it's not y'all. It's not you ends or you guys or yous, wherever you come from. It's a singular you. And so most scholars believe that um, here when Paul says the se, for those of you who had Greek, he's actually uh, making a distinction between him and the person in Romans 7. Another, and I don't want to get too much in the Greek weeds because I get too excited and uh, you, you'll be like, you need to calm down. You're being too loud. Uh, but um, in, in the Greek, Paul uses this I, I myself, I all by myself. Um, and so he, he, it's, it's very unusual what he does there. Um, and then some of our manuscripts, however, don't have the singular you, but they have, has set me free from the law. Those are the two biggest readings that we have. And if it's me free, then Paul's saying, hey, that's who I used to be. But now it's like, hello from the other side. Um, I, that, that's where I was in the past. And so what, what is Romans 7 for us as believers? It's where we used to be and where we don't need to go back anymore. Now we've moved on up uh, to the spirit side and we don't need to live in the flesh. So yes, it is possible, but we shouldn't do it. And if we do do it, then there is a danger of death. If we don't put by the spirit, put the death, the misdeeds of our body, uh, then we're going to die. There's a divine judgment that we could bring in. Uh, one thing that we miss out often as evangelicals is we think that Christ just came to save our souls. He also came to redeem our bodies. And go back to Romans 6, and we see this. And we see it in Romans 12, where we're talking about the mind of, of God. We don't want to be conformed, but we, in my uh, great Southern Arkansas raising, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And so uh, our, it, God didn't just come to redeem our souls. He came to redeem our bodies. Therefore, we honor God with our bodies. Sure, outwardly we're wasting away. We're going to die. All flesh fades away. Um, but inwardly we're being renewed daily. And um, yeah, uh, good. The guy in Romans 7 doesn't seem to have a, uh, an option. All he can do um, is sin. Uh, but we have that option. Now we can walk according to spirit and that's what we should do. So get your spirit on. <clears throat> And now for the conclusions. You came so close <laughs> to agreeing with me. We can be enslaved to sin, but we shouldn't be. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So why exempt Paul? Why put him in a different category that then makes him unable to relate to the experience so many of the rest of us have? Several times you said, this Paul can't do anything good. I don't see that in the passage. I see a Paul who says, I delight in God's law. That's something that's very good. And, and that is in the law of his mind. And who would such a person be? 
Someone who delights in the law of God. Well, that, that was Paul as a Jew. Well, then you got two options. Is it what Paul was thinking when he was a Jew? That he had all this tension? It's not what he says in Galatians 1 and Philippians 3, where he says, as to the law, I was blameless. I was advancing beyond my contemporaries in Judaism. Well, well then, is it Paul as the Christian articulating what he now realizes life was like before he became a Christian, but didn't know at that time? But... When he talks about that elsewhere, he says he counts all of that as, as rubbish. He counts all of that as King James Version dung. There's another tough word to translate. So, so neither Paul's statements about what he was like as a pre-Christian Jew or what he now understands he was really like say anything about attention like this. It's either all good from the one perspective or all bad from the other. Surely it's only when the Spirit comes in to our lives and convicts us that we recognize how much this tension is really there. Cranfield also has a quote that I want to read. And then qualify. He puts things too harshly. I don't, I don't want to put it this harshly. We believe in charitable orthodoxy. But I don't want to misquote him either. So I'll read the quote and then I'll qualify it. When Christians fail to take account of the fact that they and all their fellow Christians also, I assume that includes Paul, are still pepramenoi hupoten hamartian, sold under sin. When Christians fail to take that into account, they are especially dangerous, both to others and to themselves, because they are self-deceived. The more seriously a Christian strives to live from grace and to submit to the discipline of the gospel, the more sensible he becomes. This is 1975 English, sorry the more sensible he becomes to the fact of his continuing sinfulness, the fact that even his very best acts and activities are disfigured by the egotism which is still powerful within him, and no less evil because it is often more subtly disguised than formerly. I do not think for one minute that Joey is self-deceived. I do not for one minute think the way he has crafted the position is evil. He's so close to being right. <laughs> I want to avoid the abuse of complacency as much as he does. I just find that pastorally, knowing that Paul wrestled with this, and that he does no triumph over it gives greater hope to the deeply depressed, discouraged, addicted, and downtrodden. Yeah, elsewhere Paul also says he's no longer under the law, and now our delight, the law leads us to Christ. And so Christ is where we delight, not in the law. Um, he wants to do good, but evil is right there with him. Sin is that which is sinning. It's not even sin making him doing it. Now it's sin that's doing that inside of him. I had watched it all, Baptist. I also majored in psychology, and I learned uh, Martin Seligman's uh, story about learned helplessness, where they would get a dog and they would put the dog in the shock box, and they would absorb the dog would be electrocuted over and over again, and the dog would try to get out of the box, and they would it wouldn't happen, and then finally they would open the door. And the dog wouldn't go out. It would just continue to absorb the shocks. And so I stand here today because I believe that Christ has opened the door. That what we see in Romans 7 is what many of us have experienced, that trauma. And we've been shocked and shocked and shocked. But what we see is that we don't need to stay in Romans 7. We need to get into Romans 8. We need to come out of the box. And so if Romans 7 is your typical normal experience, 
That's not supposed to be the case. You have the spirit, you have that freedom that Christ has come to set us free. And so I agree with, I, I, although I disagree with uh, Craig's view um, that reads the plight of Romans 7 as the, ex, as the expectation of the ordinary Christian experience, I admit that believers endure a real and steady struggle with temptation. I don't think that Romans 7 is talking about addiction, however. Um, I, and, and you bring up the law. It's a great point. If you actually go through Romans chapter 7, it is about someone who delights in the Mosaic law. He begins by saying, I'm writing to those of you who know the law. And we're so vain, we probably think Romans 7 is about us. Uh, but if we go through, we see that um, Paul is talking about those who are under the law or trying to be under the law. And Paul has already said in Romans 6, that's not where you are. Now you are under Christ. Um, and he'll go into Romans 10, 4 and say that Christ is the end of the law. And so now we're underneath the righteousness by faith, not by the law. And as long as we are living underneath that law or something along that, then we are going to have that struggle, that battle, um, that impotence. And so now we walk according to the spirit. Um, I give in to sin. As a result, I feel the shocks. Um, but the significant theological difficulties and spiritual dangers rise from the popular position um, that believers are perpetually defeated by sin that we're sold as a slave and we're unable to do good. This reading collides with everything else, not just in Paul, that the New Testament says regarding God's will for us to be holy. It underestimates the Spirit's empowerment to conform us to the obedient image of Christ. Moreover, it overlooks the provision of his body, the church with whom we are transformed by the renewing of our mind as we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. But if Romans 7 is not talking about believers, what role does it play in our lives as believers? For one thing, rather than depicting the situation in which we're doomed to live, Romans 7 provides a rich description of the dreadful circumstances we've already been liberated from. We once were like the miserable creature and could do nothing for God. God did everything for us, though, and that we, for that we owe him thanks. Now our declaration becomes less, oh, what a wretch I am who will rescue me, and more, Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so instead of moaning insistently about our sin, notice how he's like, I, 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 me, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Now we come and we're like, Jesus, 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 Christ, 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 spirit, spirit, spirit. Instead of moaning about our sin, we exalt in him. For because of him, we are a new creation, his masterpiece, his poem, made alive to do the good he prepared for us to do. There's a story about Augustine that after he became a believer, he was back at one of his old haunts and one of his old paramours lovers sees Augustine and she begins to be filled with uh, rouse and filled with lust and begins to cry out, Augustine, it is I, it is I, it is I. And Augustine turned and saw her and without batting an eye, he said, I, but it is no longer I. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Therefore, we are no longer obligated to fulfill the desires of our sinful nature. Let us put on Jesus Christ and honor one another. Thank you. <clears throat> wow. Thank you both. Let's, let's thank them together, shall we? Let's begin, shall we? If you want to take your seats or keep standing, whatever you would like. First question. And again, thank you both for exemplifying scholarship as well as theological depth and pastoral concern. It's a great conversation. Thank you. First question. Could you clarify on what points do the two of you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Craig, you want to start? Mm -hmm. Oh, most, most. Um, I thought we disagreed on the possibility of sin actually reigning or mastering a Christian, but there at the end, I discovered that uh, we agreed on that too. So it sounds like it just boiled down to whether Paul never had this experience, but lots of other people can have this experience. Um, I, I think we disagree slightly in that the view Joey rejects is the view that this is a very ordinary, common, everyday experience of the Christian, but that's not the, the view that I'm arguing for, um, nor do I understand that to be what the 
the scholars and theologians that take that position are arguing for, even if some Christians themselves have said that. Um, but I think we agree on most everything else. Yeah, yeah. we disagree on the identity of the I. Um, who mm -hmm. that? But the agreement is that Christians both can fall into this, but it should not be the case. Right. Um, right. And it, that's not typical. But right. yeah, most people who read Romans 7 on the popular level, level think that this is the typical experience. Of course, I'm going to sin every day. And it's almost like the old Bob Newhart uh, where he's the counselor and he's like, stop it. Um, and so if this is your case, stop it. It doesn't have to be any longer. And uh, th there, there's dangers. Um, if we continue to dwell in Romans 7, then there are dreadful consequences. Yeah. Um, why, why are the points you disagree upon critical to you mm -hmm. in your understanding of the application of the passage mm -hmm. to the way we live our lives? Mm -hmm. So the I is Paul mm -hmm. as either a believer mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. why, why is that critical? I, I think two answers. One is exegetical. Um, I just can't get past the fact that for all the reasons I pointed out, that's what the text is saying. And whether I like it or not, I hope that my understanding of Scripture is once I do my best to figure it out, I'm bound by what it says. But the other is that, that my slice of human experience is slightly different than Joey's. I've had, uh, I don't know if I've ever met somebody who admitted to me <laughs> that they understood Romans 7 like the guy who left his wife was, was doing. I don't doubt that that happens. I don't doubt that it happens a lot. But, but my experience has been the people who are, um, that think they are defeated by sin and that their case is hopeless and they don't want to use that as an excuse. They desperately don't want their experience to be of this tension. And for them to realize or believe, they realize that even a great saint like Paul at times, not always, um, not as his ordinary mode of life, but at crucial junctures could have this kind of experience is a, a wonderful consolation and a motivation to get to the point when they can, with Paul, also say, who will deliver me? Thanks be to God who's done it through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Joe? Yeah, going back even to Origin and company, they would say that this can't be Paul because we see everything else that Paul says about his life. And if we have this idea that Paul can't even overcome sin, who is the apostle who Christ drilled within him, how could we ever mm. overcome mm. sin? Mm -hmm. And so that, that becomes a case. Um, also with it, I think most people, in my experience, uh, is they, they identify more in Romans 7 than they do with Romans 8. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to sin, they go straight to Romans 7, it bolts to it, and uh, they... they resonate more with the old Adam than they do the second Adam. They, they, they give more power to the spirit, uh, sorry, to sin than the, the spirit. And greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. Craig and I were both at Cambridge this summer and a, a student asked me what I was writing a book on. I said, Romans 7. She said, oh, you're writing a book on the chapter that comes before everyone else's favorite chapter in the Bible. <laughs> it is a great response. And I was like, yeah, but I'm writing it because more people know Romans 7 than they know Romans 8. I'm trying to get them out of Romans 7 into Romans 8. And again, I think one thing to understand is that because we're Gentiles, we read Romans 7 more about us. And it's not necessarily, talk it's, I don't think it's talking at all about the Christian relationship with sin. It's talking about this law, the Mosaic law that was given. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, we, 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 we read it ourselves into it. And miss out on really yeah. Paul is dealing with who delights in the law but couldn't fulfill it. It was um, unbelieving Jews, mm -hmm. um, the, the unbelieving Jews of Paul's day, which mm -hmm. Paul's going to end up unpacking later on in Romans 9 through 11. Mm -hmm. And so we are identifying ourselves and understanding our relationship with sin uh, with a passage that's not even talking about us. 
Here's a question from the, the uh, list, those who are here. How is this passage connected to Paul's put off slash put on language in other epistles? Either of you? Very much so. Um, the indicative leads to the imperative. We have put off the old nature. Therefore, we're commanded to put it off. Is that double speak? Or is that a very profound way of saying God now looks on you in a certain way that is brand new? He has begun a process of transforming you that is existentially real. But as long as you're in this life, you will have, however far infinity is above us, that much further to go before you could ever say that you were perfect and sinless and qualified to stand before holy God. Yeah. So you have to keep putting it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, often those who support Craig's view have this already not yet. Mm -hmm. So we've already put it off, but we've not yet put it off. Um, Preben Vong has a great comment. It's like, no, 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 that's not really biblical. It's not already not yet. It's already not fully. Mm -hmm. So we've already put it off, but we've not fully put it off. We've already put on Christ, but we've not fully put on Christ. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's more helpful than already not yet. Because again, for most people, already not yet just really means not really. Um, and so, yeah, we, we have already put it off, but we continue to. And in Colossians 3, it's a great example. Uh, set your mind on things above. Don't, stop ruminating on your sin, on your flesh, because the only way to overcome your sin in your flesh is to set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And he is your life. Your life is in him when he's revealed. And so the more we, to borrow from the old hymn, uh, focus on the, his uh, glorious delight, the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so I think the way that we put on Christ is to stop looking about the things I want to do, I don't do, but instead look at what he's done for us and enables us to do now. And I could mm -hmm. very happily accept already and not fully. Mm -hmm. I would just want to say, if I go back to my mathematical background, <laughs> if I'm going to draw, no math, no math. I'm going to draw this yeah. on a, a line graph, mm -hmm. then if this is where I am, how far up there do you put God? beyond anything we can ever get to. So no matter how much, not fully, however much progress I get, I still got an infinity of ways to go and let's never deny that. Yeah. yeah. There are three types of people in this world, those that can count and those who can't. Yeah. So I, I, won't, bring in, I won't bring in math. Um, and five out of four Americans <laughs> don't understand fractions. And 50% of statistics are made up. I think I'll ask another question because yeah. this is going well, south. Let, let, me, really yeah. <laughs> let, let me say this real quick. I, I, I think a, a, a non sequitur in Craig's understanding is his graph is that God's here and we're here and we're trying to get there, but God's not here. God's inside of us. His spirit's inside of us. And so we, us being baptized with Christ, we've been united with him. And so it's not us trying to get right here. It's Christ in us that's bringing us there. Um, so like Paul was saying, Romans 10, uh, I'm at trauma. I'm abnormally born, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without, effect, without effect. And because of his grace, I can do all these things, not me, but Christ, that grace is within me. And so I feel like righteousness is not a divine status that's been poured upon us. Like Luther says, it's more than that. It's the righteous status that actually enables us to live um, the righteous requirement of the law. But you did follow the trajectory when you said Christ is bringing us there. Yeah, I was trying to bridge so, the gap. Yeah. How you far know. is he bringing us? <laughs> yeah, right. and when do we get there? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think it's maybe not this, but him coming to us because when he comes back down to Prusia, that's when he's glorified within us. Yeah, then it'll mm -hmm. be perfect. Mm -hmm. I know a lot we of agree people on that. who get really nervous when theologians do math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's going to go speaking in Spanish next. Yeah, he can't right? keep up, right? What right. can no? Yeah. <laughs> Doctor Dodson. How would you respond to someone who would identify as a, genu as a genuine Christian and faces addiction, substance, sexual, or otherwise? Yeah, get counseling. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the same way that I would say of a person who has cancer, 
um, to go see a doctor. I don't think Romans 7 is talking about addiction. Uh, again, putting it in the context of what Paul is talking about, Romans 7. Uh, my, my youngest son is on the autism spectrum. And we had a group of students over uh, when my daughter was a college student. And uh, I said, hey, go ask uh, my daughter's friends who wants tea and coffee, coffee and tea. And he was volunteered. He has social anxiety. And we were like, oh, my goodness. And so he ran into these, uh, to the living room where all these college girls were and says, raise your hands if you want therapy. I don't know how we got coffee and tea from therapy, but uh, it was awkward. But all of us probably need to raise our hands. And, and so, yeah, th- th- if it's a mental illness, uh, which I think addiction is, then uh, that's something that we go to counseling for. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, if we're talking about uh, addiction, uh, that, 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 that's a different conversation than what I'm yeah. having in Romans 7. So you're, you're essentially affirming that Christians, those who are in Christ, mm-hmm. can have addictions yes. that, that mm-hmm. need to be treated yeah. by therapy. Yeah, but we have something that those who don't, we have the Holy Spirit that can help us yeah. um, have that redemption. Um, and so, yeah, if there isn't, if you are struggling with addiction, often with Romans 7, when they say the things I won't, don't want to do, I, 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 there, there's uh, pornography is often involved with the young men that, that are talking about. And yeah, uh, don't do it by yourself. Don't, don't um, try to overcome sin and addiction by yourself. We need community. And so often when Paul talks about body, he's not talking about your individual body. He's talking about, our body as the church. Um, and so uh, spiritual formation, overcoming addiction, uh, it, it's not an individual pursuit. It's a corporate effort. And so uh, I can't crucify my flesh by myself. I need my brother and sister to do that. And so we need true confession that comes in that as well. But yeah, the, the short answer is that uh, we, we need, God, God has gifted uh, men and women with great counseling skills for addiction. And we have a great program here that helps yeah, out do. with that. Yeah, Indeed. <laughs> All right. Next question. Dr. Blumberg. Do you think the prevalence of false conversions is partly to blame for the mm. intense confusion over this passage? <laughs> and how do we know what a false conversion is? Good question. I... Yeah. That's And where do you fall on the eternal security spectrum? Those are all linked together. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, the short answer is yes, I'm sure it does. Mm-hmm. Um, but that can also be too facile a response. Mm-hmm. I am not uh, a person who believes um, in the so-called free grace movement that you can accept Christ as Savior and never make him Lord, although it would be a really good thing if you did. Um, But I had a long discussion a few years ago with a man who you would know, um, who worked for the organizations he used to work for, who worked in Eastern Europe, who did some of the most courageous and committed uh, ministry to Eastern Europe when it was still in Soviet hands. And he firmly believes that the number of People who will ultimately be saved includes people who had genuine, sincere conversion experiences and then for whatever reason had false apostasy, maybe would be the way he would put it. Right. But somehow they're going to come back and somehow God's hanging on to them. And the more I see the whole breadth of human experience, including those that profess Christian, I am just so thankful I don't have to play God and say who's in and who isn't yeah. come judgment day. Yeah. But that's just a longer way of saying yes to the original question. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Is the groaning of the man in Romans eight twenty three? not the same as the cry of the wretched man in 724, namely a regenerate soul still united with an unregenerate flesh body. You want to tackle that? I don't think it's the same growing. Romans 8, uh, put that in the context, Paul says that we are heirs of God, which means we are co-heirs with Christ. 
which means we're going to share in his glory. But in order to share in his glory, we also have to share in his suffering. Mm. And so Romans 8 at that, this point has transitioned to uh, bodily suffering, mm. not dealing with sin. Mm. Uh, there is a tension, but the tension is not uh, you're a slave to sin and you're not a slave to sin. Uh, the tension is, is that we have redeemed bodies, but we're still in this other body that's, that's broken. And so that's where the tension comes in. But yeah, the groaning there, remember the Holy Spirit is also groaning yep. uh, and creation is groaning. groaning. Yep. There's three groanings yep. and they're groaning for redemption. And so yes. I think it's more of this broken body and just the, the things of the world. Even what Peter goes on, he who has suffered in the body is done with sin. Yep. Um, it's like, man, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just ready to have this redeemed body. Yep. So I, I think that's a groaning. Would you agree, Greg, Craig? Yeah, yeah. And, and like you said, I'm not sure which of the three groanings the question was about. Um, I went immediately to 826, where when we don't know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And that, that's got nothing to do with, I don't think, groaning about sin, but just I'm so confused. I don't know what to pray, what to say, how to do it. Spirit will help. The question referenced 823. Oh, sorry. Did you say that? I, well, you know, I have a, I'm old enough to say, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think I did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then and, I agree with Joey. Yeah. To bring in 26 and 27, the, the, again, in contrast to the guy in Romans 7, where there's the Holy Spirit doesn't see do anywhere around, the Holy Spirit is praying through yeah. uh, this person yeah. um, so that God works all those things for good. Yes. Good question, though. Is the, is the groaning concept, if I may follow up, is that language a suffering type of groaning uh, as distinct from a yearning type of groaning? Or can we, can we distinguish between those two? Does it matter? Do you understand the kind of the difference between the two? Stenazo. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And oi, what was the other one? Um, Onaizo as well. Um, yeah. Often like the birth pain. So you have birth creation. Pain. Yeah. So it's that, pain. Yeah. But it's Suffer. birth pain. So there's that hope. There's expectation. Yeah. That. Creation stands on her tippy toes. Tip toes. How do you guys say it here? Tippy toes. Tip toes. Yeah. Stretches out her neck in hope, groaning. So there is that yearning yeah. aspect that's there waiting for the children of God to be revealed. Um, but but she also was subjected to futility pain. against her will. Some, some it was suffering. in hope. Yeah. Yes. So um, and... The, the birth metaphor was the strongest. Excruciating and birth metaphors were the two greatest uh, metaphors for pain. So I don't know what Paul understands about that. But yeah, so creation is groaning for that. Um, but I think it's more dealing with suffering than with sin. He probably Next, watched some of it. Yeah, right. Hmm. Next question. Dr. Dodson, what do you think about the desire for, quote, the desire for good mm -hmm. in the man in Romans 7? Yeah, great question. Uh, so a lot of people who argue for the popular view say, well, this person has to be a Christian because a good person never desires good. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 they need, to, and this is very Lutheran, very Calvin, you know, Calvin, this lay Miz uh, type guy, and, and that we're, even the best Christian is going to be miserable for the rest, until the day that they die. And there, there's no way that a, an unbeliever could desire to do good. But if you put this in its context, especially uh, the parallels that we have outside of Romans, uh, and even that word wretch is like the stock phrase for someone who wants to do good, but cannot. Mm -hmm. And so we could put it around Paul's, uh, even like the philosophers during the time, they would even say, hey, I want to do good, um, but I can't. I'm only inching along. And so you have that idea where there's that, that battle, that strain that's there. Um, but I think, again, if you put Romans 7 in context of the law, we have Israel yeah. that's there who desires to do good. We see like in the Psalms where, man, I love me some law. Give me some law, 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 law. But then they, they can't fulfill the law. And so if you look at the story of Israel, that, that's been their case even from the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Moses gives them the law and says, hey, it's not too hard. You don't have to go up to the heaven to get it. You don't have to go down. Uh, it's right here in your mouth. But And then God's like, but you're not going to keep it. So here I'm going to get this song and this song's going to get stuck inside of your head. And the song is going to testify that you're not going to be able to obey yeah. the law. And yeah. so that's the context. It, it's about Israel. Um, and uh, how the Israelites desired to, to do good. Again, Romans uh, 11, 10, Paul's going to come and say, yeah, they pursued righteousness. They wanted to be righteous, but it was the wrong righteousness. Like, oh, uh oh, you know, what you talking about, Willis? Uh, I, they got the self-righteousness rather than the righteousness that comes by faith. And so um, I think even Paul desired to do good before the Damascus Road experience. Mm. But right? does he say that anywhere else? What's or that? does he not say... Before I was a Christian, all I did was desire to do good. I didn't mm -hmm. have this tension. Mm -hmm. So then you say, well, it must be Paul, the Christian, understanding what his life really was like. Mm -hmm. 
But then That's at right. that point, yeah. he says, no, I had nothing good. I count it all as rubbish. I've, I've rejected it all. Mm -hmm. So whether it's Paul talking about his pre-Christian life mm -hmm. from his pre-Christian perspective mm -hmm. or his pre-Christian life from his <laughs> post-Christian perspective, mm -hmm. either way, you don't get that tension. It's all one thing. Where do you see that tension elsewhere when Paul is talking about his pre-Christian life? Yeah, we, Philippians 3 is what you're referring to, where Paul says, I was blameless according yeah. to the law. And Galatians yeah. 1. Yeah, right. Advancing um, Judaism yeah, beyond yeah. my contemporaries. Mm -hmm. so, so, what's the, the, so where's the, the tension? The, the tension that he expresses yeah. in Romans 7, 14 to 25. Yeah. Right. I, I think that this is the perspective. Paul's looking back at right. what his life really was like outside of Christ. In Philippians 3, I, I don't think we can interpret Romans 7 in light of Philippians 3. But then the where, context where does he say yeah. from his Christian perspective mm -hmm. that he delighted mm -hmm. in the good? Yeah. So here I, I would go with my, Mark Seifert, the idea that here he's looking at Israel and the story of Israel. He's incorporating, showing that solidarity with Israel who did have that, especially like the psalmist, the, kind of the doppelganger right. uh, who wanted to do it, but he, he could not. So, so yeah. it's strange to use mm -hmm. I if he means everyone else except Yeah, him. no, no. I think he's uh, showing unbelieving Israel in light of the context. I mean, again, many of us, we read Romans without hearing Jew, 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 because we, we just kind of ignore that. Sure. But here, the, Paul has this huge burden. And what's he going to come as soon as, he's gonna, uh, as soon as he finishes this thought? He's going to get to Romans 9, 1 and talk about his people according to the flesh. Uh, if you go back to Romans 5, 12, he's talked about Israel and when the law came and how it was before the law. And so I think uh, there's this narrative dynamic of Israel that's the elephant. Oh, I don't doubt that. Yeah, I just don't see yeah. it as separate from Paul. Yeah. I'm Presbyterian enough to believe <laughs> that in the sovereignty <laughs> of God... When did you last go to a Presbyterian church? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the things I want to do, I do. <laughs> 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 but in the sovereignty mm. of God, the last question... Mm -hmm that we have mm. here is one minute before we're supposed to finish. Okay. How fine is that? It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I want to pray together with you and thank the Lord for our time together this evening. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for supporting uh, Denver Seminary and our commitment to biblical studies. I hope that you are have been encouraged in your understanding of what it means to walk with Christ, to read scripture intentionally, to ask these good questions, and to come into conversations where you disagree in a way that allows us to leave rejoicing in the work of Jesus and committed to the same mission as we move forward. Uh, not once did I hear one of you say, well, you clearly don't believe in inerrancy if you take a view different than mine, which is essentially Christian cancel culture, right? So shall we say it? So let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you again for these two dear brothers, for the way you have gifted them, gifted them to think, gifted them to analyze, gifted them to bring ideas together, gifted them to communicate all for the sake of your gospel in the world. We pray that what we've learned this evening, the ideas that we've come to embrace, the questions that we still have, we pray that in both our embracing and in our questioning, we would be empowered to make the gospel known to those who do not know it. May we, Lord Jesus, bow before you in humble gratitude for the privilege of bearing your name in the world. And we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. The Lord bless you and give you a safe drive home. <laughs>